It's our fifth and final meeting for this week, at least before the election. Welcome to Business Morning and good morning. Uh, thank God it's Friday, the day before the election. It's another time for 55 minutes of relevant and current business conversations here on Channel Television. I'm Amy John Mekwa. Let's start off with oil prices. It rebounded by about 1% on Friday after a meeting between Saudi Arabia and Russia calmed markets amid strong China demand expectations after a banking crisis sparked a sell-off in global financial and oil markets this week. Brent crude features rose 81 cents to $75.51 a barrel, having snapped three days of losses to settle at 1.4% higher on Thursday. U.S. West Texas intermediate crude features climbed 78 cents to $69.13 a barrel after closing 1.1% higher in the previous session. And uh, we also see that there's been a lot of speculations, especially as it has to do with the bank crashes that we've been having both contracts and as the WTI and Brent hit their lowest in more than a year this week and are set to post their biggest weekly falls since December at about 10%. Oil and other global assets were undercut this week as the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Banks and the U.S. and Swiss governments scrambling to shore up liquidity at banks. Still talking oil, but this time it's edible. Malaysian palm oil features were set for second straight weekly drop on Friday, even as prices rose from a one-month low hit in the previous session, supported by recoveries of rival oils and good export data. The benchmark palm oil contracts for June delivery on the Bursa Malaysia Derivatives Exchange climbed 1.25% to 3,982 ringgit a ton, and that was by midday break. And today we're also looking at the opportunity to take profits on, on the back of strong daily and Chicago soy oil recoveries after sell-off. Well, uh, still in the global market, grains now. Chicago soybean features rose for a second session on Friday with a further reduction in drought hit Argentina's production estimates underpinning the market. Wheat rose 0.9% and was poised for a first weekly gain in five weeks as the market awaited renewal of a Russia-Ukraine export deal while corn edged higher and Chinese buying. And we see that in the Pampas growing belt in Argentina, the drought is showing no sign of ending yet and losses uh, ongoing. The most active soybean contract on the Chicago Board of Trade added 0.2% at $14.94 for a quarter of a bushel and wheat was up 0.9% to $7.05 a bushel, while corn gained 0.5% at $6.36 a bushel. Still staying with commodities, but back here in Nigeria, Nigeria has lowered its cocoa output projections for the 2022 and 2023 season to 24,000 metric tons from 250,000 metric tons previously projected. According to a report released by Economic Think Tank, financial derivatives company, this is because of adverse weather condition and the ongoing cash scarcity. Meanwhile, the country's export of superior quality cocoa beans surged 203 point seven zero percent to 74.65 billion naira in the fourth quarter of 2022 and that's up from 24.58 billion naira in the third quarter of last year and uh, talking about naira scarcity we'll bring you updates of that uh, this time our correspondent victoria long john in the federal capital territory brings uh, the customer plight, bank customer plight in abuja Three days since the CBN directive that the old 200, 500 and 1,000 Naira notes remain legal tender. Today, I'm here on the streets of Abuja to try to get some money for myself. The queue is too long, so I head to another bank. This bank has no cash, so I try the ATM of another bank, and the situation is the same. Finally, I find a bank where I could get some money. I could only withdraw 3,000 Naira, but it's better than nothing. I 
easily got my hands on some cash and even spent it. But how many Nigerians are this lucky? This is what uh, they paid me at the, at the counter, 3,000. 3,000 they paid me. So this is over the counter? Yes, that's what, that's what they are paying everybody. They can't have it. No ATM. ATM is not working. Unfortunately for these customers, they have not been lucky today. I've been on this bank before 7 o'clock, and uh, I had a, a card they gave to me that is numbering BK42 for collecting cash. But I'm not able to enter the bank, even at, at yesterday, they fought here and closed the bank. They've given me numbers this morning. I've been here like 7 o'clock in the morning. So and I've not even entered the bank, so the thing is really bad. We are in the queue since. So it's just with my turn just now, then I withdraw money from the ATM machine. It appears there is no end in sight yet to Naira scarcity, as bank customers are still not able to get a hold of the Naira notes, a situation that has further frustrated Nigerians. Only time will tell when Nigerians can finally put this behind them and heave a sigh of relief. Victoria Longchen, Channels Television News. Well, that sigh of relief is what a whole lot of Nigerians are looking forward to. I mean, uh, this is even after the uh, statement from the Central Bank of Nigeria that uh, 500 and 1,000 era old notes can now be circulated. In spite of that, it seems uh, things have hardly changed. Uh, yesterday we had Kelly in Lagos and we saw the situation still the same and that's uh, Victoria in uh, Federal Capital Territory. I mean, that's where the headquarters is. You would have thought at least by now there'll be circulation. When will this stop? Nigerians keep asking. Uh, we've had a lot of people go to uh, social media to speak, to ask channels to say, you guys are not doing anything about this. But I mean, this is what we can do as channels television, is to bring the story of the people to the fore and do hope that the authorities, in this case, the central bank, even the presidency is watching and would do something to help people. I mean, I thought we had gone past the level of getting 3,000 Naira limits. At least we saw someone in Lagos a couple of days ago get 10,000 Naira across the counter. But it's back to 3,000 Naira and it's old notes. I mean, this is really frustrating for a whole lot of Nigerians. And we do hope that something will be done and fast too, you know, because we have, we have talked about what the economy is losing. Yesterday, we, we, we dwelled on that. Uh, when it comes to the GDPs, there's even the threat of recession, either in the third of the, or the fourth quarter, if this persists. So please, let's uh, get this sorted out and um, move on with uh, you know, growth in the economy. We do not want another recession, and it's a risky time now to see what's going on in the banks around the world, starting from the United States and Switzerland. We do not want uh, another catastrophe like that. But, um, well, the governorship and state assembly election is tomorrow, so Nigerians getting set. Uh, today's program is going to be dedicated to what are people saying, what are people looking out for as Nigerians, what are their demands or expectations from a new administration, a second time, second term administration for some others, um, whichever way it will go. Well, we'll begin this morning uh, by speaking to the editor, Political Economist Online, Mr. King, Ken Ugeche, uh, who also speaks to this. Mr. Ugeche, good morning. And uh, let's hear from you. How can Nigerians choose more efficient individuals as governors, as lawmakers, as they go out to vote tomorrow? Your perspective? Actually, a crucial election in terms of uh, governance at the grassroots level because it involves the states and then the people that will represent the various people in their local assemblies. So, this is a much uh, critical election. And why do I say that? Because we have seen that in this country, governors over the years have lived on handouts only, handouts from the central government, which they share every 30 days. Except for, if you look at it, Lagos and there may be River State that have a IGI. The IGR is a, a little bit up there. In fact, Lagos can even be self-sustaining. 
from the statistics over the years, just because they looked inward and were able to maximize the commercial nature of their state. I also expect the incoming class of governors and then those that are going for a second term, if they win and should they win, I expect them to be more creative in terms of sourcing for revenue, not depending on the federal government basket. And how do we go about this? Nigeria is basically an agrarian country, and we have not fully tapped into the potential that we have in agriculture. If we actually do agriculture on a commercial scale, in the manner that it has been done in the Netherlands, in the manner that it has been done in other countries, that are even landlocked countries, we shouldn't be begging. No state in Nigeria actually should be looking to Abuja every 30 days to pay salaries or to execute projects. So the incoming governor should be able to, on their own, motivate themselves and their states and all the components in the in their, in their cabinet for everybody to be resourceful, looking inwards, looking at the strength of your state. Every state has abundant mineral deposits. Every state has the capacity to go into fishery for those that are bordered by rivers or littoral states. They also have the capacity to go into full-scale agriculture, cultivating the very fertile land that God has given them. But we have become very lazy. We also recall that actually in those days when it was regional, many states lived on agriculture, many regions depended on their farm produce. I recall the plantations in the old Bender state, the rubber plantations, where you get where they tap and get what they call gum, which they use for tire and then the rubber industry. I recall also that in those days, the southeast depended on palm oil. So the, every state in this country has the capacity to generate their own revenue, to be self-sustaining, so that whatever you get from Abuja, you can now use for other things. And truly, that is actually the mental indolence of the governors over the years. They have not been able to... A governor cannot be in office for four years, and you cannot point to what you have created in terms of wealth. It, it shouldn't be so. Four years is enough for a government or a governor of a state to start a project on a commercial scale, execute that project to commercial success before even leaving. And good they think that some of them may be coming back for another four years. So it gives them time to also grow what they have started. I know some states that are planting a lot of palm, palm, uh, palm, uh, palm trees because they want to go into the allied industry, the industry that are tied to that palm produce. Because in the palm industry, especially, nothing is a waste. And in most of the cash code that we have in this country, nothing is a waste. Technology has been able to, this, those things that we consider waste before, technology has been able to, to turn them into other materials, either as raw materials for other companies, or even as finished products. So every state has the capacity to be self-sustaining. But can they do it and will they do it? But that is also the agenda we should be setting for them as, as journalists. That they shouldn't come to office with a mindset to begin to go to Abuja every 30 days to collect their yeah, so called. Uh, um... All right, Mr. Beche, the issue of uh, states looking inwards is obviously not a new conversation. Um, uh, instead of uh, depending on FAQ monthly. But the thing is, what do you expect um, the new administration, uh, returning administration in some cases, what do you expect them to do differently? What do you think they can do differently to change the narrative when it comes to this issue of states looking inwards? Okay, my take on this actually has been the issue of the true fiscal federalism that people have clamored for. Every state should be allowed to control resources within that state. And if you allow them to control the resources so that this federal central government that has been so bloated and overfed and now looking bigger than the, than the elephant should also be creative, should also be more prudent in their fiscal uh, dealings. 
Uh, what has happened over the years is that um, because there is this guaranteed money every 30 days, the state governors tend to be lazy. But my take is that this is not the time. Because in this century, technology has shown that a lot of things are possible. So states should create that um, environment. And the environment in this instance means that, for instance, if we are a state has capacity to go into agriculture, you can create cluster of farmers, deliberately so created, even among the young people, even among the middle class people. Create clusters where people can go into commercial farming. I'm not talking about sister farming. Commercial farming funded by the state. We saw what we CBN has done with the Anchor Borrowers program. And today we are all most people are eating a made in Nigeria rice, grown in Nigeria rice. We can also do that at the state level. For different uh, 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 plants, it is very doable and it's very. It, the only thing is that these governors lack political will. Political will because they, there's a comfort coming every 30 days. And that's why people like me clamor for that fiscal federalism that every state must control its resource. All the resources in the states, then you pay royalty to the center. If we get to that level, as we see it in other crimes, for instance, the United States that we have borrowed their own brand of uh, presidential system of government, if we borrow from them, let us copy completely even the fiscal aspect of the federal government that we run. So states must be allowed to control, to a reasonable degree, the resources available to them. We have been doing that in, in a manner that actually flouts the law. For instance, Zamfara has been made to even take care of their own goals. Even though it was against the law, it was the only one cost problem that Nigerians got to know that Zamfara has the mining gold. Other states have their own mineral deposits. They should be allowed to also mine their own uh, uh, resources, mineral resources, and commercialize it and make money from it and pay royalty to the center. So if we do it that way, states will be self sustaining. Definitely they will be. I think that is the formula Nigeria should be pushing. All right, uh, Mr. Ken Nubeche, uh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Although, of course, uh, that issue of controlling of resources uh, would uh, have to go through the lawmakers uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, to, be, to empower or decongest, as you have said, the center and give uh, the states the power to control their resources. Um, I guess uh, that's, that one is a long one, which we'll also need to do. Um, uh, law making and all of that. Thank you so much. Mr. Ken Ubeche is publisher, Political Economics Online, sharing his thoughts with us. Uh, well, we're still going to stay on this and uh, we're going, uh, Mr. Ken Ubeche there sets uh, the agenda in the agricultural sector. A lot of people would say that the country, Nigeria, has a lot of potentials, untapped potentials in the area of agriculture. And so let's speak with a farmer now. He calls himself a farmer. Mr. Tunde Banjoko is the managing director of Motunde Banjoko Farms. Uh, and uh, he also joins us this morning virtually to share his expectations and thoughts uh, as he goes out to choose uh, a governor tomorrow. He since he resides in Lagos, but I mean, farmers everywhere in the country, 28 states to be precise, will be choosing who their governors will be for the next for years. So, so Mr. Banjoko, thank you so much for your time this morning. Let's start by asking you what you expect uh, that you think can make your life as a farmer easier and other farmers as well. I, I think as a Nigerian and somebody who I've lived all my life in this country and looking at what has been happening in the recent months, things are really not the way we expect them to be actually in terms of food production. So some of my expectations, for example, I'll be looking at this new administration paying attention to our cost of inputs. The cost of input has gone by almost 300% in the last two years. So I'll expect them to start looking at how can we start working on all these prices of commodity that directly influence our cost of production so that we can have the best of price in the market now. Uh, some of the input we used to buy for 2,000 are going as high as 6,000. So the expectations are high. I will expect 
both at the state level, at the federal level, for us to start looking at how can we bring down this cost. So that's one major area that I think is affecting the cost of food we all buy in the market. So, I mean, some other areas where I will also be expecting them to work on, both at the state and at the federal level, we are still struggling with multiple taxation, even as farmers, moving your commodity from the farm to where it's being sold or to your off-takers, you hear this state telling you, this tax is to this state, this tax is for this, this is for goods, this is for that. And by the, at the end of the day, you see yourself spending so much, even on transportation and logistics. And maybe closely related to that, I want us to start talking seriously about the insecurity in the country, because that has affected our production. A lot of farmers, are probably not motivated to go to their farms. A lot of farmers have abandoned their farms. Those who probably go in some part of the country need to pay to, I mean, the enemies of the state before they can go to their farms. So these are serious concerns that this new administration needs to pay attention to. And it must be seen as being done, not just a lip service or just comment, but people need to now be comfortable going to their farms because the more people run away from their farms, the lower the food available for the population, the lower the amount of food that can be moved to the market. So we now have to seriously work on our insecurity issues, pay attention, mobilize the right people, equip them, I mean, our security agencies with the right equipment and get them even accountable because some of them have also been found culpable in this act and all that. So, uh, and then we also now to start, we need to start reviving some of our farm estates that have been moribund for years. We need to start reviving some of them now. Some of them all scattered all over the country. We need to start reviving some of these moribund farm estates that were designed to boost our internal food production. So these are some of the areas. And then, of course, uh, the cost of diesel also is one thing that has also influenced our production. I don't know how we can manage that aspect, even though I know it has some international um, influence, but we need to now look at how locally we can start influencing the cost of diesel because it's affecting our bottom line in terms of production. So those are some of the key areas that I think this new administration, mm. both at the state and at the federal level, needs to pay attention to. All right, Mr. Banjuko, let me just uh, plead with you to uh, hold on for a couple of minutes. Uh, we have a correspondent, Kelvin, in uh, ANEC office here in Lagos to bring us up to speed on the preparedness of INEC for the election tomorrow. Kelvin, uh, I, I hope you can hear me. I know you did try to speak uh, into the verdict earlier. Uh, Kelvin, I hope you can hear me now. Uh, uh, tell us, do we have assurance from INEC now that they are set for tomorrow, especially when we are talking about the issue of IREV? That, that was a big one from the last election. What is INEC saying about their preparedness for tomorrow's elections? Oh, all right, thank you, Ini. Um, I am right now at the premises of um, um, INEC area office here in the Keja local government area, um, Lagos State. And um, uh, there are a series of meetings finalizing, I can tell you there are a series of meetings uh, being held to finalize uh, the movement of sensitive materials to what across the state. And, um, uh, but for the meantime, before I call in uh, a senior official to tell us more about what is happening and why the delay to this point, which is getting to the noon of the day, well, let me just inform you that um, important um, people are here on ground talking about security. If you look to my right, you can see that we have um, security personnel on ground who are supposed to escort and see that these materials get to their destination on time without any um, body influencing them or uh, cutting short this movement on the way. We also have transporters on ground, but my, up there you can see transporters, the buses are set, the transporters are on ground to uh, 
convey these uh, materials to their various destinations. So that is what I can tell you we are seeing right now, what you are seeing on air. But I have with me the deputy director here in the office who is going to be telling us more about the preparation and why the sentiment, whether the sentiments are on ground, whether they are actually ready to be uh, distributed to the um, various uh, worlds. I have with me Mr. Gabriel Tyre, he's the deputy director here in Enic. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Sir, Mr. Dari, yeah. Tari, can, can you tell us, we are here at the NAC office, I can see that you've been having serious meeting in there, but we expect that this material should have been left here and then to various words. Can you tell us the situation of things and the way forward from it? Yeah. In the first place, um, I heard them say the delay. We don't have any delay. The plan for the commission is to make sure all the materials are in the rack this evening. But because we have a proactive rec, the resident electoral commissioner, and he has said to us that by 2 o'clock, he wants everything to be there, not before 6 or 6 o'clock. So what we are doing now is to make sure they moved all the materials to the rack. We bashed them yesterday, both sensitive and non-sensitive materials. They are all bashed, so ready to be deployed to the various areas. We have about 10 areas in Kedja here. So what we are just waiting for is for the school to go um, and to close by 12. But as I spoke with the executive uh, secretary, he has said he has instructed all the schools that I'm, we are using for our rack center, our racks, to give us at least minimum of two classrooms so that we can put our materials. So that's what we're about to do now. So we're going to move. We have about 50 buses on ground, so 10 per each area to move those materials to the racks. We have the security personnel, they are all there. So my experts, they are all briefed. That was what you saw me telling them. They've all been briefed and they know what to do. All right, Mr. Terry, let me just uh, let us look again at the um, issue, uh, issues of security. Um, I don't know whether you envisage any challenges in terms of security conveying these materials to different words during the presidential na National Assembly elections. Can you tell us um, that you, you, you don't foresee any um, encumbrances in terms of security when these uh, materials will be moved to their destinations? Well, by the grace of God, we don't foresee that. Although if I'm, I'm not God, I don't know. But Ikeja is known for a very peaceful place. We don't even have a flashpoint in Ikeja here. So um, one thing I've noticed from my experience, those do the right thing, everything will fall in place. So once you're doing the right thing, the only problem we have the adults complain, but for any security breach, no. But even with that, we are prepared for that. The security people are already on ground. None of this material will be there without security accompanying them to their various racks. And the DPO came here, we've had that meeting, and he said, as this security are moving with them to the racks, they will remain with them until the end of the pool. Okay, let me just ask you this one. Um, uh, that during the presidential election, we had issues with the BFAS. Uh, it's a burning issue, probably discussion and all that. And INEC has assured us, uh, the national chairman assured us that um, the BFAS will be ready for the tomorrow's election. How uh, can you confirm that to us, whether you have all these beavers on ground, whether they have been reconfigured uh, completely or not? All our beavers have been iced, reconfigured, and even have a backup. So we are very, very much ready. Even with the presidency, when everything was ready, we still download, we still upload those, those things there. So everything is ready, I can assure you that. By the grace of God. Yeah. Apart from security and the transporters that are here, uh, I was also expecting some personnel that will come before these materials will be moved. Uh, what is the situation? Are they on ground or do you expect them to come before them? So what we did to ask the personnel to go to the racks. So most of them are there. So it's the SPOs that we ask to wait behind to accompany those materials here. Because if we ask those personnel to come here, we are conveying them again, creating more load for us. So they've, we send an SMS to them. They've all responded and they'll be in the rack by latest by 6 o'clock. Every one of them is here. All right. Thank you, Mr. Tari, for that information. So in a, it is what is happening here from what you've heard. Um, it means that um, everything is set. We're just waiting for the time to, for these materials to be taken to the different destination. And we hope that this will be done smoothly uh, without any hindrances. So back to you, Ine. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Kelvin, for bringing us up to date on the preparations uh, towards tomorrow's election. And uh, do stay safe out there.
Well, let's get back to our conversation. You know, it's election period, so it takes priority. Whatever we have from the field there to keep you updated on what's going on uh, towards the elections holding tomorrow, uh, that takes priority. But, I mean, this also matters. Uh, we've been, well, we had before, we took Kelvin there, the managing director of Amotunde Banjoko Farms, Mr. Tunde Ban Banjoko, telling us um, the farmers' expectations uh, from the incoming administration. So, Mr. Jan Banjoko, thank you so much for your patience now. I'll just let you go in a couple of minutes. Uh, after you've told us this issue of threats to food security, how real is it? When we look at the data available in the last eight, nine, ten years, our food insecurity level has been going up. I think it's around 33% now. So it's a cause of concern to anyone. And it's something that is evident also that we can see, and with even this present cashless policy that has not been well executed, it's like it's been worse than what it was before now. So uh, it's a reality that we see every day. We see people going hungry, and the numbers keep increasing. And uh, you know, funny enough, when you even look at the data, you assume it's probably only in the rural areas, but even in the city, food insecurity is real, and people are, I mean, they can attest to it. Our support, we, we can walk around it. It's not impossible. We have over 84 million hectares of arable land in Nigeria, and we are just cultivating less than 50% of that. So it's something we have the technical know-how, we have the manpower, we have those that can do. We, we have all it takes to produce enough to feed ourselves. So it's something we can definitely work around. If some of the items I raised earlier on, the multiple taxation, insecurity, cost of impute, if all these things are attended to, I'm sure in the next few months, and if we start prioritizing the right commodities, there are some trigger commodities, like maize, for example, maize, wheat, rice, if we start prioritizing some of these product commodities, it will change the dynamics of what we are facing at the moment very fast. You look at the impact on egg, the poultry sector, these are some of the things. How many people can now afford even the, you know, before now we say the egg is the cheapest source of protein for an average person, but that's no longer the reality. The egg is no longer the cheapest source of protein anymore. And you know, funny enough, some months back, what people assumed to be their source of protein in our own language in Nigeria, Akmomo, the government said they are banning that because they need it in the leather industry. So you realize even the little, and people are saying even that 0 0.004 protein in Pomo, give it to us, leave it to us, because that's the only thing we can afford. So uh, we should just start working on these things and then, but the level of food insecurity is so high and it's scary for some of us. It's very scary, very scary. All you know right. What done about it. Yeah, well, we do hope uh, that as uh, the new governors or retained governors uh, get back to work after the elections, that they will prioritize the issue of food security. Thank you so much, Mr. Atunde Banjoko, the managing director of Amotunde Banjoko Farms. When we come back, we're still staying on this, but uh, we'll be speaking by then with uh, the Federation of Agricultural Commodity Association of Nigeria. They tell us their own expectation as they go out to vote tomorrow. It's still here on Business Morning on Channel Television. Welcome back. Still watching Business Morning here on Channels Television. We now have joining us virtually from Abuja is Mr. Belo Dogondaji, the General Secretary of Federation of Agricultural Commodity Association of Nigeria. And the conversation is not far-fetched. It's uh, their expectations from the incoming administration. Mr. Dogondaji, thank you so much for your time. Good morning. And um, what type of individual is your association looking for? Um, in the, for the incoming administration as they go out to choose tomorrow? That have a fashion in agriculture value change. 
what I mean, people who are mindful of the commodity business all over the country. What I mean by that, I mean the complete value change that is the, the, the production, the processing, and the marketing of these agricultural commodities. Across the board, we want to have governors that have fashion in the agricultural sector. We want to have governors that have interest in developing the agricultural sector that is migrating from what it used to be from the simple farming tools to mechanizations. We are looking out there for governors that have interest in how to encourage the value additions in our agricultural commodities, I mean our crops. We are looking out there for governors that have fashion in agriculture and those that have fashion for not to import what we eat, but to eat what we produce in this country. We are looking out there for people and for governors, for state legislators that have interest in expanding the landscape of agriculture in various states. All right, and uh, a lot has been said about enabling environment. When we talk about enabling environment, what do you think should be prioritized? I mean, it's very, I mean, it's, it cut across so many, so many, so many, so many sectors. What I mean, you have to mobilize. The mobilization is critical. Then the infrastructure, then the political will, the person at the aim of affairs, does he have the interest in mobilizing people towards the agricultural development? Or he is someone who is passive? Whether it happened or it didn't happen, it's not his business. We want people who have passion, we want people who have the business in agriculture, we want people who are industrious, and who are looking at who are looking at agriculture to be their main base? All right, sir. That Thank is what you. we are looking for. Okay, a very <laughs> very passionate demand there from uh, the Federation of Agricultural Commodities Association, asking for a passionate leader, governor, even at the federal, uh, people who will be passionate about agriculture and the value chain, not just agriculture. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Belo Dungodaji, the General Secretary of Federation of Agricultural Commodity Association of Nigeria. I believe this is what uh, they have had, uh, the conversation they've had with their members, and this will be at the top of their minds as they go out there to vote tomorrow. Now let's head to London, where Juliana is standing by to bring us up to date on some major stories there. Juliana, good morning. Well, TikTok has been in the news for some days now. I can't say for good uh, reasons, uh, but now Britain is banning TikTok. What's this about? Good morning, Innie. Yeah, this was an uh, interesting development uh, that first broke yesterday morning. Um, Tom Tugendhat, who is the National Security Minister, a couple of months ago asked the National Security uh, Centre to uh, launch a probe into TikTok, uh, which is pretty popular, in fact. Um, I don't know if you've got a TikTok <laughs> account, um, Innie. I may try and follow you. Um, but, of course, it is the world's most popular app, and it became particularly uh, popular 
during lockdowns, lots of uh, people working from home um, decided to go on to it. It is owned by ByteDance, which is a Chinese-based firm. But because of uh, the geopolitical concerns uh, with China, um, ByteDance decided to move their HQ uh, from Beijing to Singapore a couple of years ago to try and distance itself uh, from the Communist Party there. That hasn't helped uh, because we know that the EU Commission, as well as uh, the US government, um, a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago, decided uh, to ban the use of the app on their um, government devices due to security concerns. Then there was a lot of uh, pressure by Prime Minister, on Prime Minister Rishi Sunak by Conservative backbenchers. They then had this probe. And then the result was, yes, it is uh, deemed uh, too risky. So we had that announcement yesterday uh, by Senior Minister Oliver Dowden, uh, basically informing um, MPs across uh, the House that uh, it would no longer uh, be available on the app. I I think most people within government welcomed this as well as other uh, parliamentarians. Uh, but now it's uh, there's a lot of questions about whether or not they can use them on their personal devices. Grant Shapps, uh, business uh, minister, he's pretty popular on TikTok. I've seen some of his um, uh, funny videos. Um, he put a post up there this morning saying he won't be deleting it. So now there are questions as to how far uh, the British government are going uh, to go with this. There has been a reaction from TikTok who say that dis disappointed with the UK government's decision, uh, that they believe um, that it's been led by misinformation and uh, the company is just uh, basically uh, being the fallout guy, shall we say, uh, for the geopolitical spat that the West is currently uh, having with uh, China. But for now, it's not banned in the UK, but certainly um, if you have a government device. Yeah, well, uh, not uh, very good times uh, for geopolitical politics, uh, and we hope it does not escalate, you know, out of hand. But, I mean, um, the, the strike thing in the UK, we see passport office workers, and then the junior workers uh, are, are calling for talks. I thought we were on our way out somewhat. Slightly on a way out, a pay offer was agreed uh, with uh, some members of the NHS yesterday, which is good news. I'm sure we're going to get more information about that uh, today. But the industrial action um, across many sectors does continue. And uh, we've had an announcement uh, from the PCS union, which looks after uh, passport office workers. And they've confirmed uh, that a thousand of their workers will be uh, striking over a significant number of days, starting from the 4th of April. It's all part of the same issue that most workers in the UK UK are having at the moment, not happy with pay, not happy with their job, not happy with their conditions, basically want to get paid uh, what they uh, deserve. And uh, for the post, um, for those who are working in the passport office, uh, they want to be paid in line with inflation, which is currently at 10 percent. That's what they're asking. The government are doubling down on their statement, which is they can't afford the 2.4 billion pounds it would cost them. Uh, but this is going to be an interesting one uh, because, of course, we are uh, coming to that all-important summer season. We had issues last year because we didn't have enough people um, in the airports to look after uh, the millions of people that were desperate to get some summer sun. Is this going to be the same issue? It won't be about the airport staff. This will be about the fact that people haven't been able to renew uh, their passport. So more headache uh, for the Prime Minister as um, we wrap up what has been a pretty interesting um, week economically. Well, interesting indeed, Juliana. Thank you so much. I'm sure we'll get updates at 1.30 during uh, Business Incorporated. Thank you. Now let's move to the market. Uh, without much ado, Anieti Edits uh, walks in with numbers with. from yesterday. Good morning. Well, um, let, me, let me just uh, pass the bubble for the market. Uh, ah. it is, yes, it's Thursday, but uh, one word, bearish. That's what it's... Um, yeah, that's what we had me. yesterday, yeah. I guess. Uh, we should Across just... all the markets, currencies market, fixed income market, equities market, unlisted securities market, it was just um, a lackluster performance. And mm. um, uh, although we will be talking to uh, analysts to give us some um, more details. details. So, yeah, so he'll be talking to us. We're just journalists. Okay. So um, for the, the fixed income market, there you see there, various sentiments. We saw a mixture of both demand and sell-off 
for the markets. For the bonds market, we saw the average deal there expanded by five basis points to about 12.9%. But what you see here, total number of deals carried out uh, about 24. When you look at the board here, uh, uh, six apiece for the 27th of January 2026 20, paper at about 6.6 um, .6 billion naira. The same for 17th of March 2027 paper. So that's it. So we saw investors um, carrying sell-off on the March 2024 paper. It's uh, expanded by 100, uh, 198 basis points. And then we saw some contraction at the mid-segment of the market where uh, investors demanded the April 2032 paper. And that was down by uh, 49 basis points as well as the July 2045 uh, bonds paper. Uh, so that's one. We also saw that uh, contraction. So let's move over to the treasury bills market. It's also bearish sentiments there. We also saw participants um, sell off on the 182-day date to maturity paper, which uh, it was uh, it's expanded by 62 basis points. But on your board there, the 14th of March 2023 paper, which is later this month, uh, 72 deals carried out there, and that accounted for what you see here, 87 deals. Let's move over to the CBN special bills because the OMO market, it was flat. Average deal there was flat at 3%. So what you see here, total number of deals carried out, 52, and the most attraction was on the 29th of May later this year uh, 2023 paper so that was it for that market now let's talk to Ajibola Aero Phillips who's a uh, fixed income dealer at FDN Quest to give us more details about that uh, thank you for joining us Ajibola hi good morning Anise. thanks for having me how are you doing um, I'm fine thank you now uh, this week I think about uh, this is about uh, two days after the primary market auction, as well as the inflation numbers which, which came in, maybe not to some people, not quite a surprise, but to some uh, uh, surprising. Now, how has that affected the fixed income market when we take that into cognizance? Um, just like you guys rightly said, market has been a mix of um, sentiments this week. Uh, there's been a bit of bearish sentiment in the, in the, in the treasury bills market, especially. Um, the long end of the of of, of the of the uh, auction that debuted at 9.5 or thereabout um, went up to seven seven percent or 7.5 percent before retracing again and closed that up about eight percent level yesterday. Um, that's just because uh, there's, a, there's an FX auction today, um, which is going to take out some liquidity from the market, and so market has that whole bearish sentiment. Um, the bond market, however, is a mix of both. Um, there's an auction being expected next week. The, uh, the sentiment is that demand at that auction would be a bit huge. And so there's been a bit of pickup in the secondary market this week in the bond market. Okay, so now, um, uh, Jibala, just um, in 30 seconds, um, we will be having the second meeting of the Central Bank's uh, Monetary Policy Committee on Monday and Tuesday. So what is your expectation for this meeting when, you know, uh, in reaction to the higher inflation rates? Um, this is a bit dicey for me, um, but personally, personally, I think I think there will be. Uh, Samia will still maintain the hawkish stand. Um, I think there will still be a hike, about 25 to 50 basis points, and that's just because of the fact that um, if you take a cue from the ECB, yeah, that just yeah, hiked the rates yesterday by 50 basis points, despite all the mayhem happening in the in Europe. Um, also, you expect that just like the Fed, Fed has continued to signal that there will be a rate hike, despite the fact that you know inflation is is beginning to taper. Um, I still I I am of the opinion that the central bank or the NBC will take the same um, hawkish stance and increase increase rates. Mm, okay. All right. Thank you so much. So our eyes are always on the market as usual. Thank you for your time on our show. That was Ajibala Aero Phillips, fixed income dealer at APN Quest Merchant Bank. So, Ini, um, let me just tell you how much the market lost. Three hundred and thirteen billion. I don't know no why I want to leave here. a bit of pill on my on my tongue before you leave, but I need to yeah. go get ready for tomorrow's election. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> All PBC right, ready. Great. All right. Thank you so much, Anite. And um, Ladi Williams comes in with his own numbers from the crypto space. Yeah. Talking uh, about getting ready for uh, elections, I feel like Bitcoin is ready uh, for the elections. Let's just flip over to the price of Bitcoin okay, this morning. Nice I'm sure you the... saw it in it. Bitcoin is doing quite well. It's giving us a good Friday uh, there. Very 26, unusual, 000. you know. It's normally in the red. Exactly. Fridays. So let's call it a, a good Friday. 
or a green Friday. Election Friday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we see that 26,000 up 5.88 percent, 39.25 billion dollars. Uh, that's volume traded for uh, Bitcoin. Let's look at the price of Ethereum, 1,720, leaving that 1.6 level, going higher, up 3.68 percent. And we see volume traded at 10.63 uh, billion dollars. I'm sure we have uh, Gilbert Jopata now to uh, bring us up to speed. Hello, Gilbert. Good morning. Hello, Gilbert. All right, we'll still try and get uh, Gilbert again. Let's look at the uh, top alts by market cap uh, uh, this morning. We see uh, most of them also in the green uh, this morning. BNB is uh, leading uh, that chart there, still holding uh, above that $300 uh, dollar level. That's for the top alts uh, by market cap. BNB there up about 3% uh, this morning. And uh, we see uh, XRP also 37 cents holding on uh, still within that 30 cents uh, range talking about xrp we see cardano there 33 cents uh, also holding on let's uh try uh, gilbert again hello gilbert good morning yes good morning Mr. Ladi. good morning gilbert so it's uh it looks like the market is giving us some kind of uh a good weekend now friday we see bitcoin that hitting twenty six thousand. with all that's happened you know uh, with with the banks uh, silicon valley bank We've got Credit Suisse, all of them, and the banking industry. Now, all eyes on, on the Fed. What's going to happen next? What are you expecting? Okay, there is this popular knowledge in Wall Street that says when the Federal Reserve uh, starts uh, to increase rates, it generally doesn't uh, stop. It keeps going until something breaks. So until last week, the market was rising in a bigger rate hike of about 50 or 75 basis points. But this expectation changed dramatically with the breakage of the Silver Gate and the Silicon Valley Bank. The, the question has been, is this uh, a significant breakage to make the Fed's uh, pivot? Uh, while a little percentage of the market, including Goldman Sachs, uh, which is the second largest investment bank in the world, expect there will be no rate hike next week, uh, they think uh, economic strength is more important than inflation. I, I, I still think that is unlikely to see the Fed pivot uh, next week because the Fed have uh, constantly reiterated that they will increase interest rates until inflation is put uh, under control. So I, I think that if they stop uh, their actions to put inflation under control, it's going to build uh, a market perception uh, that their ability to put inflation under control is conditional. And uh, the market is already pricing in over an 80% chance of seeing a 25 basis points uh, next, next week. And uh, this is why we are seeing some short term uh, uh, relief in crypto assets. You know, this is a bit of a fresh air and we are having more uh, range world movement uh, instead of the possibility of a downside spill if we had seen maybe 50 or 75 basis, if the market still priced that in. All right, I guess everyone looking for what's going to spark that uh, bull run in this market. But thank you so much, uh, Gilbert Jopata. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you. And go yeah, out there welcome. and vote. Yeah. So, um, it, it, the way it's looking, the market is looking uh, quite green, you know, this morning, talking about Bitcoin. But if you look at central bankers, you know, globally, even right here in Nigeria, you know, not many investors are fond of you know, the CBN, <laughs> <laughs> the central bankers at this time, because we know they're trying to rein in inflation, but at the yes. expense, you know, of the markets and, the market and, uh, and uh, of the banking sector. Exactly. I mean, yesterday we had uh, the First Republic Bank in the United States also yeah. uh, needing help, and thank God they got it, but I mean, doesn't yeah. signal Banks the crying end for of help it. at this point. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ladi. Thank you. Uh, we'll see you at 1.30. See you. All right, so that's it on the program. Thank you so much for being a part of this 5.55 minutes that we did this week. It's been a pleasure uh, bringing those stories to you, those conversations to you. But do remember, the most important thing now is tomorrow is an election day, so please do go out to vote. And remember, here on Channels Television, you get all the news here. I'm Mimi John McQuarrie.